Chinese leader Xi Jinping was just confirmed in office, securing a third term and eliminating political rivals. Now the people are protesting against his regime. Tens of thousands in China are demonstrating against the government's strict zero COVID policy in several cities. The lockdowns have been going on for weeks and are costing jobs and wealth. Despite prevailing against his opponents in the Communist Party, some protesters are even calling for Xi's resignation. So on to the point we ask protests in China. How deep is public unrest? I'm Javier Arguedas. Welcome to the program. Now let's meet today's guest. Tian Sun is a Chinese freelance journalist here in Berlin. Alexander Görlach is a journalist and author and an expert on China based in New York. And Felix Li is also a journalist. He was a longtime correspondent in China. Now he works for the German specialized news outlet China Table. To all three of you, thank you very much for being here, especially for coming the long way. And welcome to this week's program. Now, uh, Tian, I'd like to start with you to assess the current situation. Even though it seems like the protests worn off a little bit um, after they started, uh, we're still talking about the biggest wave of protest in China since the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. How did we get there? Uh, how frustrated are the Chinese with the zero COVID policy? Mm. I think um, from the protests alone, where we're how shocking it is and how many people are actually take it out to the streets and what they were calling for it's already a quite big testimonial how frustrated are chinese people and it's not just frustration i think it's too light of a word it's anger it's um it's really desperation it's a sense of losing of hope there's a lot of emotions there and also obviously what happened in ulumuchi the fire is sort of just a tipping point it's the last stop um, because it was very visual, you really see people, like you see videos really widespread and people screaming because the fire, fire escape was blocked. And there was a three-year-old girl died in the fire and she is exactly three years old. That means her entire life is COVID policy. She, hasn't, she, hasn't, she didn't really see anything outside of the small apartment. So I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think for sure, and some people lost jobs and uh, companies shut down. And um, obviously, there is very fundamental anger that's a, towards the situation. It is definitely very emotional, Alexander. And yet, China, of course, we cannot forget, is a gigantic country with 1.4 billion people. Yes, it's thousands on the streets. But is that really that big a movement? You have to see like that from May onwards. NGOs have counted up to 735 protests. The Economist just recently put the data together and analyzed it. And the causes for these um, protests were diverse. It was like COVID, but it was also the banking crisis in June where people could not withdraw money <clears throat> from ATMs. There is the uh, real estate crisis where like people lost money they already put forward to buy apartments. So there is a variety of, uh, of reasons for discontent. And I feel like the... Uh, just now, this is the uh, the last drop, so to speak, with the COVID-19 policies. So it started with one person, this one man who put up this banner uh, right before the, uh, the the party congress in October, asking for Xi Jinping to be removed and called him a dictator and a traitor. And that was just one man. And now there is like tens of thousands of people. And there could be hundreds of thousands in a month. And there could be millions in two months. So, Felix, do you also share that view that these protests are really not only about the COVID policies, but that it is far more widespread? I think it is based mainly uh, because of the COVID policies, but uh, it's a symbol of uh, how Xi Jinping treats his people in the last few years. And I think Xi Jinping, he went too far. Uh, I think he went with his zero COVID strategy. It doesn't make sense from a uh, health point of view. I mean, we are in number th number th in the year three of the pandemic. We have vaccinations. Uh, the virus is not so dangerous as it is in, in, at the beginning, and he still holds up to this very very strict measurements. And I think uh, a lot of people think it's not about uh, getting con COVID under control, but also how far can he go with controlling his country and how far can he go to uh, lock down his country or close his country. And uh, because he 
he wants to control everything and especially um, the people. And I think uh, uh, the protests show that, uh, uh, that he went too far. Controlling people and of course also controlling the protests themselves because no matter why you protest in China, it's definitely not easy to do so. The protesters have gone out of their ways to send a message and know that their cause is full of risks. Let's have a look at what's at stake. Tens of thousands of people in China are demonstrating on the streets with blank sheets of paper in their hands. It's the largest protest of its kind since the Tiananmen Square uprisings of 1989. They are demanding that the government reverse its zero COVID policy and calling for the resignation of state leader Xi Jinping. Because of his strict lockdowns, millions of people are stuck at home, losing their jobs and unable to leave, even to buy basic necessities. A few weeks ago, the Communist Party elected Xi Jinping, granting him sweeping powers. And critics like former head of state Hu Jintao were simply removed from office. The authorities, however, weren't able to stop this lone protest on a bridge. This sign calls for freedom and demands an end to COVID restrictions. Have the people lost confidence in the state party? And that's exactly the question that I would like to pose to Tian. Have the people lost confidence in the party? Mm, I think it's a very big question. And I think a lot of people, so we were talking about why people went to the streets. And uh, obviously in Shanghai, in some cities, we really hear this very shocking um, calling. Um, but are they actually rep representative? Um, so. I think when we look at why people went to the protests and what are their what their callings and what they are asking for, there's a wide spectrum of why they're there. And the ones who are asking for the change of political system is actually a small percentage. Most people, what they want is to finish this ridiculous lockdown. And they want freedom in terms of not necessarily to the level of freedom in everything, but more the freedom they want to go back to their normal life. I think that's what they want. Um, so I think that represents what they are really towards their anger too. And it's and it's a lot of people actually, they don't think it's a problem of the party. They think it's the problem of how the orders from the above is um, executed here on the local level. So they're more mad at the local level instead of the party. So I think obviously there are a big um, group of middle class that's leading this protest, but the people who can actually take it out to the street and who can make a change, eventually, how sure are they and what are their appeals are quite different from, from one to the other. Now, Felix, uh, what's the relation that people have to the government in China? Because uh, yes, the people are protesting on the streets because they, as you said, uh, maybe have the feeling that the government went too far, but, um, the Communist Party and Xi Jinping specifically have also put China on the world stage as a superpower. Is there a sense of national pride that is uh, important here? Uh, definitely. Um, a lot of people, uh, or oh, this is the promise of the Communist Party in the last uh, three, four decades. Uh, more wealth, more uh, a stronger country. And uh, as long as this promise is still going on, and a lot of people are, haven't reached the stage of becoming middle class yet, as long as this promise that all the poor people, uh, you, that the Communist Party is fighting poverty, as, as long as this lasts, there is big trust on the government. That doesn't mean um, that there's also a lot of unrest or uh, uh, that, that they're not happy about the government, but um, at least they don't question the whole system. But, um, I mean, it's, it's a gap now in, in China. We have a lot of uh, people still in the country who haven't reached uh, uh, the middle class yet, but in the big cities, there's an urban, uh, the, the urban people, especially young people, uh, a lot of students uh, from the academ uh, academics, uh, they're out of their job. They don't, they don't have jobs, they suffer from the COVID uh, the strict COVID measurements. And um, I'm not sure if they really can create a big movement uh, uh, that Xi Jinping's power is in danger. I'm not sure, I wouldn't be so sure because this also 
this doesn't demand only anger, but this also demands a certain uh, degree of organization or an opposition, and there is no opposition in China. So, um, yes, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, people are unsatisfied, uh, but it doesn't... Uh, it's, it's not enough to create a whole big social movement. Do you think that as well, Alexander? Because uh, we have seen uh, a difference between the perceptions in the countryside, for example, and in the cities. But as you mentioned, not everything is going according to plan. Uh, do you see any yeah. type of risk for this Communist Party or for Xi Jinping specifically? Yeah, I would, I would also beg to differ a little what, what Felix said. Is, uh, do you, you, if you see what people chant, and in our language we, we already say like, People are treated like subjects in a way. But people say, like, we don't need an emperor. That's what they chant. So people have understood what the mechanics behind Xi Jinping's reign is. So yes, they might not want to uh, want to introduce maybe a multi-party system and elections every four years or whatever, because in, in, in the memory of any living soul in China, that has never been the case. But they feel like they are not treated, I, I believe, according to the promises, even of, of the communist agenda, and certainly not of the market economy or capitalist agenda, where you are like a purpose in yourself, or you are a human being as an agent in your life. And you can say, yes, there are restrictions, and people all over the world had to live with some restrictions of that or that sort. But then they were lifted, they were, they were changed, whatever, Xi Jinping. So now people chanting for more freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the rule of law. And it all leads to like the system, how she has changed the country in the last 10 years. They are not in favor of that. And we also know that people in the party are not in favor of that. So I, I don't see an immediate danger that he's going to be removed in four weeks. So maybe to the opposite, that he has closed the ranks in the party congress. But the people in China now have been awaken, if you will, if you want to use that very dramatic sort of language. But if the Communist Party now would react to it, which it does to a certain extent, like lifting a little here or there, this might not be enough in the long run. But also it's dangerous for the party because that's a democratic mechanism. People ask for change and then the change is about to come. And that's actually something that she cannot allow. I'm but actually we're also, yes, not sir. very optimistic about it because when I talk to people who are in China, they also have the feeling that we have to look at what kind of education majority of Chinese received and how do they have this political awareness actually targeting the problem the deep-rooted problem to the party and to the people and to the leadership? I don't think so. I think they just see what are in front of them, not necessarily linking to the central government. And they're not, have, they don't have this political awareness and education to analyze the political system. However, it, yeah, sorry. No, just to add up, um, I think Xi Jinping has one very strong tool. He built up a, a surveillance system which has never existed in mankind. And this is very efficient. I mean, you see that the people who were on the streets with masks in the dark this weekend, some of them are, are already getting arrested because the surveillance cameras got their eyes or whatever. And this is, of course, I, so I don't expect much protest in the next few days or me, maybe even few weeks. But of course, the anger still exists and the... Yeah. It still exists, and that also leaves a few questions open in the Western countries. The Western democracies are watching the developments in China, scrambling to find a proper way to react. And it's not the first time. China, an indispensable trading partner, is very allergic to any type of foreign interference. Chancellor Schultz goes to Vietnam for a state visit. This country, alongside Singapore, will become an even more important trading partner in the future. Germany is pushing for free trade agreements with other Asian countries to reduce the country's unilateral dependence on China. The German Minister of Economics, Robert Habeck, is a strong advocate for urging the German business community to look for other Asian trading partners besides China. For example, Habeck recently stopped China from buying an entire container terminal at the port of Hamburg, leaving only limited financial investment. The U.S., on the other hand, is taking the sledgehammer approach, banning Chinese products from ZTE to Huawei. TikTok, the popular social media platform, could soon follow suit. They say that Chinese products threatened national security. By the same token, U.S. microchip producers may only export product to China under the strictest of terms. Cooperate? or containment? What is the right strategy to deal with China? 
And what is the right strategy? Alexander, the West has long hoped that trade could essentially uh, foster political change in authoritarian regimes. We have seen that fail in Russia. Is it now failing in China as well? The, if I'm not mistaken, the Bertelsmann Foundation a few years back calculated that our the democ democratic trade, uh, the trade from democratic countries with non-democracies amounts to 15% of their GDP. So meaning like, the, of course, German car industry, that's a, a different uh, different ball game. But like saying there is a way to just like minimize that sort of trade. There is already more going on between democracies because the rule of law and the security of investments is upheld. And what we now see with Russia and also see with China, you can easily say if your whole system runs on cheap gas from one dictatorship and like um, trade with another one, that's not sustainable. You will be paying the price later on, what we now do with the, in, in regard to gas from Russia. So I feel like you have to rather like think of that with a longer strategy to realize that it's not a sustainable way of doing business. And clearly, at least Germany is trying to diversify um, the way its economy works. Uh, Felix, do you think that is even possible uh, under these circumstances? It is possible, but it's a huge step and it's going to cost. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that the whole German economy is dependent on China, but there are certain companies, big companies, who are very dependent on China. And, uh, 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 of course, uh, there is this danger that uh, the geopolitical conflicts are rising and that Germany and German companies has to decide on which side they are on, whether on the Western side with the West Western values or uh, are they going to... Uh, is business with China more important? And, um, yes, uh, uh, I th the... the uh, the Green Party in the German government is trying to diversify. They're not talking about decoupling, but getting at least getting less dependent. And the chancellor on the social democratic side is sort of uh, blocking. And um, I think Germany has to be honest. I think if they s decide uh, it cannot go on f like like in the last few decades, uh, but this also will gonna cost. And I'm not sure if the German government is ready to admit to also to the to the German companies that um, if there is this China clear China strategy, um, that this will also cost a lot. And it definitely also costs uh, some force when countering what is happening in China. Although we've seen a quite mild reaction from the government so far, uh, why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can, like, uh, sort of, um, re like, return to the last question that you asked about, and then I can get back sure, to that sure. question. Um, we think that this Wunder durch Handels failed, like some people already claim it's failed in China as well. But actually, this protest proved to be it's it hasn't failed. So why do you think there are so many people who actually take it out to the street and look at who they are? A lot of them are have connections that with abroad, like maybe they're. Um, friends, siblings studying abroad, or they work for German companies, or they had a certain kind of form of political education, and it's a big group in China. So how did this facilitate the change? It's actually the people-to-people -people exchange that brought by the business. So I think that's why it's quite important for Germany to keep this going on. Not only there's a certain dependency from German economy to China to create jobs and so on, but it's, it also creates awareness. We, we really undervalue this people-to-people -people exchange and how they can change through daily activities, like to see what freedom actually looks like. So, um, and um, when we talk about why you were saying that you feel like this crackdown of protests are not as hard as people expected, I think sometimes the government needs a bit time to think that how they want to react. That's why they're taking their time. Um, but as we've also I commented on, because of this tie somehow with, uh, with the outside world, with this, so China is not isolated. Also, it's a group of people is not isolated. I think it's quite important to keep that in mind in the future that these group of people shouldn't be forgotten. That's very optimistic, of course, but what if it works the other way around? Some fear that China will start not only exporting its products, but also its political model. Do you see that risk that we might have more authoritarian regimes in other countries than through this power? Well, China is already exporting its surveillance technology to Zimbabwe and other great countries, if you will, like dictatorships, basically. There's no doubt that Xi Jinping's idea 
uh, of how a country should be governed, he wants to export that. And not only just to make other countries dictatorships as well, but to deflect uh, the attention of the free world from China. This is why uh, China through North Korea is supporting Russia and all that's like these axes or why, why they then also encourage to meet up with Iran. And so this is like, certainly we see all that. And this is why it's important because if we, when we speak it here in this in this little circle, it always, we're not talking about Western values. First of all, like the free world is extending to Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay, Mauritius, which is not the classical West, but it's also like values that we agree upon uh, on, a, on, a, on a universal sort of sort of um, base because if you are like for no reason incarcerated if you are if you are beaten up or like even killed so I feel that's a very common human feeling to not be okay with that so that's not a Western invention as Xi Jinping and Putin put forward saying that's a new way of the, the West to colonize us you see people going to the street because they know about their dignity and that there are things that are not ought to be done with them in any just system and being a one-party system or multi-party system that might be on another sheet of paper Paper, but the point being like they understand that there's like they have rights that come and derive from their value and their human dignity. Values that the West certainly wants to defend, Felix, but how difficult is it with the power that China has? Do you see a double standard that some are calling out on this specific case uh, compared to how the West reacts to protests, for example, in other countries? Well, you know, yeah, you can call it double standards. On the other hand, I mean, China has changed a lot too in the last few years. I mean, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, dealing with China was a totally different thing than, uh, than dealing with China today. China is very aggressive. Uh, also it has a very aggressive strategy with the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, they are, have another strategy, which is called dual circulation, which doesn't, which means uh, to get and independent in the inside, get independent from Western technology, but making other countries dependent on China. This is, I would call it, economic war. And I'm not sure if everyone here in Germany or in Western countries have realized what that means. And I think it's not enough just to, okay, yeah, be critical on China and say, sometimes saying something, but doesn't have a clear strategy how to deal with this very aggressive strategy which is coming from China. To get back to the people, uh, Tian, uh, we have seen some signs of relaxation of the COVID measures. Looking into the future, do you think if the COVID measures are relaxed, will we see everything get back to normal in China? I think getting back to normal will take a while because the government, they, they realized it and then we can see the recent development. One of the anecdotes is like two or three days that the, the CCTV5, which is the sports channels, when they broadcast the football games like World Cups, they cut the, the, the faces of the audience out because they're not wearing masks and they don't want people to, to know that actually the whole world is open. But today and yesterday it's back so the audiences are actually showing on TV. And we also see official statement that they're saying, OK, Omicron right now is not as dangerous as before. And we're ready. And 90% of the people are vaccinated. That's an official statement. So we already see this change of direction. So I believe that's opening up is coming. But obviously, the government want to avoid the situation where they're losing face so dramatically by changing 180%, 180 degree. So it will be slow. Do you share that perspective, Alexander? We have a few seconds left. Yeah, I mean, there, we have all no crystal ball. And once you have a country like China where there is one person calling the shots, it's very difficult to forecast what's going to happen. And I, I, I feel what I said, like people have now tasted like freedom and understood what can happen if they uh, go to the streets. So it remains to be seen to whether or not these small changes in the, co in the, co uh, in the COVID policies will in the me medium term, let's say, Mm, help with the uh, youth unemployment, which is up to 20%. So there is like not about a few days less in quarantine. There leads to be substantial changes to be like for the party to be safe again. And we will certainly see if that is the case. Um, I assume that is all the time we have. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm, 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 um, I'm just hearing that. Um, I still have one last question for you, Felix. Thank you very much. Um, do you also think that it ultimately would lead to the economic development and if that also brings some relaxation? Um, I mean, the, uh, 
the uh, the releases which are set in, uh, to release a stricter uh, uh, COVID measurement, I think they're just minor. Uh, the, in total, China is still uh, has still keeps on uh, holding up to that zero COVID strategy. And as long as this, uh, this is the case, I think the people will are suffering and the economy is suffering. And um, I don't see a big change in the next few weeks. We'll see how that goes, and we'll definitely be there to analyze it with you. To all three of you, thank you very much for joining us, and to you for watching. Remember, you can also comment, like, and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Looking for DW News. I'm Javier Arguez, and I hope to see you next time. Till then, take care. Goodbye.